Um, they tell me that the New Year started at midnight. I, didn't, I wasn't around. I was fast asleep at the time. <laughs> And I don't have a problem with that. Some of you would have been up and about and others of us would have just been cooling it, as it were, right? Um, th this morning, we're, we're going to look at, at this Psalm 116 as we start the new year. Um, when you come to the Psalms, I, I can still remember as a teenager uh, beginning to read my Bible and especially beginning to read the Psalms and, and in a number of the Psalms, as I read it, I thought the person who ever wrote this is going to be in trouble. The way it was just expressed as life was, do you know? And you'd been brought up to be nice and not say the difficult things, is that right? And I thought the Psalmist, but then as I read it, I said, yes, before the Lord. He just, just laying out before the Lord exactly where he was, exactly what was happening. And isn't that life? And that's what God responded to. And that's the wonderful thing about the Psalms. And you remember the Psalms are the centre of the worship for the people of, of Israel. They were the songs when they came together. You automatically joined in the Psalms together. And so the Psalms, although many of them are written from a personal point of view, they're all written in order to be shared and enjoyed together as God's people together. Just a little bit of one couple of sentences from a book that I want to just mention to you about this psalm, and especially this psalm. He was, this, the author says, The Bible does not teach you that you are to get out of your pain and into God. The Bible teaches that God comes out of heaven and into your pain. We do not come to God on the other side of pain. God comes to us in pain our pain and uh, often a psalm 23 that we keep saying at everything around the place and we fail to recognize people are saying it but when you stop and think of the psalm the psalmer says when I go through the valley of the shadow of death you are with me right so it's he has come in and Christmas is when we remember that he took upon himself the form of a man he suffered for us on the cross and rose from the dead. Christ came, God comes, and he's there with us in the midst of it all. And this, as we have New Year's Day, I was thinking, well, it's a great opportunity, the new year at least, it's a great opportunity to reflect on the past. It's a great opportunity to understand what is going on now in the present and a great opportunity to refresh our thinking before the Lord as we now look into the future. And that's exactly what this psalm does. It's what this psalm does. Uh, you have an outline of, the, of, the, of my talk and you also have a copy of the psalm that you might like to follow as we go through. Um, I'm, I'm keen on books, you will find. <laughs> and, and, and there's one book I want to share with you that um, helped me in my thinking here. Uh, this book is by Dan Ortland. And, um, and now Dan Ortland is part of a group of people, um, Tim Keller, Don Carson, John Piper, what the Gospel Coalition group, right? And he's part of this, so it's really A1. But th this, he's a great author, Dan is, in, and in just being succinct. And what this is, it, it's a, the 150 Psalms, and there's a, a small half-page thought about the psalm, explanation of the psalm that you've just read. So 150 psalms and something to think about in the psalm. I've been using it this year, uh, or <laughs> last year, and I'm one of those terrible people that some people think, but I, I, I love to use a highlighter. This is my book. And, uh, and the psalm is in here from the ESV, and as I read the psalm, I highlight the key words that I see as I'm reading, and then as I read what Dan has to say, I highlight a key thought in there, and I have found this extremely stim stimulating and great. If you've got nothing that you've got that you're going to get on and begin to look to God's word early in the new year now, something fresh you may need to work on to get thinking, something that's, that's easy to do each day, you know, not too complicated, this is a great book for that. 
And as I've been going through this, the other book that I, I came up with that I, I keep coming back to is Jim Packer, Knowing God. Have, do, have many people read this book, Jim Packer, Knowing God? It's been around for years and years and years. Jim Packer um, is with the Lord now, but he, he was a great uh, person the same, in the same category of people. And often we're thinking about what, what does knowing God really mean? And when we look at this psalm, you'll see the psalmist really knows God. So what do we learn? How do we know about this? How, how do we understand this? This is a wonderful book of good, just basic gospel reading to figure that out. And just one fine little thing, I noticed that Kurong have a sale, 20% off until Tuesday. Um, that's all there. If you want to have a look at those and see what they are, I'll, I'll leave them there so you can do that. Something to, as you think of the new year, what am I going to do that's going to stimulate me and centre my attention in the Lord? Right. So Psalm 116. And if you notice, as you look at this psalm, you notice in the outline it breaks up in, into three basic parts. And one part I've called the starting point of the psalm, the focus of the psalm, what's, what's it going to be on about? The second point is, gracious is the Lord, and the third point is, what shall I render to the Lord? What shall I render? And as I said, it's written personally, but the psalm, as you read through the psalm, you'll find that it includes the whole congregation. And it's this author who's gone through this experience is now sharing it with the body of Christ and together they're encouraged and together they're seeking to commit themselves afresh to the Lord. So the starting point, let's just look at verses 1 to 4. I love the Lord... Because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me, the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. But then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. It's interesting, in the... Uh, when you're translating from one language to another, often you've got to add a couple of extra words in to make sense of it in the language that you're translating into. Because in the Hebrew, this is really love God. Statements that's made here. And so we throw the I's and the other bits in and the ands to, to make it flow that we can read it. And so what it's an it's a emphatic statement. And the love that's mentioned here, the word love, is what is in the tense that not only present, but it's in the continuous present tense. This is something where I am and where I continue to be. I continue to love the Lord. And the Lord here is the capital L-O-R-D, which is Yahweh, the word that God gave. It's the word that he gave to his people. I am your God, you will be my people. Why do I love the Lord? Because he hears my voice, he heard my plea for mercy. And then there's another step again. He inclined his ear to hear me. We worship and know a God who we know is personal. He's made us in his image, personal beings. That's why relationships are so important to us. As you can see that relationships are so important to God. And the incline the ear is just a lovely phrase. It has the concept. You know when, when you, you're deep in conversation with someone and they're beginning to say something and you, you're really involved in it, you, without you knowing, you just go a little bit closer. Is that right? Or isn't that true what happens? You just lean over because I'm going to get the whole message of what you're saying here. And what this is saying is the Lord inclined his ear. He longs to hear what I wish to say to him. He longs to hear. He longs to relate to me. This is extremely personal, this concept here. He wants to hear every word. You know, because we are rebellious human beings, we would have no idea that God is love unless God had not revealed himself and his love to us which is what he's done supremely in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And remember, John, when he's writing his letter to the early Christians, says, we love him because he first loved us. We know love because God is love. 
and therefore it's in confidence, tremendous confidence, that I can call out to him, call out to the Lord. The writer says that the reason this was all happening was because I was in a bit of really sticky, situ or difficult situation. He expresses it in fairly strong words. He says, the snares of death encompass me, the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Now, we're not told exactly what the situation was that he was in, but we're, but we're given a very clear picture that it was quite serious indeed, quite serious indeed. He suffered distress and anguish. And when it talks about the, the snares of death and the pangs of Sheol, it's, it's, it, the concept is, is that it, 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 it compressed me. Do, do you know, it, it, it constri constrained me, it constricted me, it had held hold of me, it laid hold of me. There's aggression here. And we don't know exactly what it was, but I think every one of us go through these times of life, we have been over many of them, of times of physical and mental distress, of where the pangs of death, where anguish, where sorrow, where pain, where, where our lives are so in such a mess and so chaotic, our relationships are so chaotic, uh, things are happening, whether it be physical health or mental health is all occurring to us, physical and mental, and we are ensnared by it. You know, we all know the fruit of the Spirit when Paul was talking to the Galatians, what the fruit of the Spirit is. But before he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, he says, what are the works of the flesh? What is it that Satan uses? What is it that in our natural body, our sinfulness, what is it that ensnares us? And he's, it, the list of works from the flesh from Galatians 5 is sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, envy, drunkenness, all these things that claim us, all these things that entangle us. And no matter how hard we try, we can be overwhelmed and feel there is no way out. It has a grip on us. And therefore comes the desperate cry, then I cried on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Deliver my soul. This is the call of anguish. The call of, I am, there is nothing I can do. I am so bound, I am so stuck. I can find no way out. But I call on the name of the Lord. You only call on those who you believe can really help. Isn't that true? And you, he, he says, the only one that I could call to is the Lord. And so I called to the Lord. I called out to my God. I called out urgent, emphatic, with great confidence. And here is the turning point in all this hassle that he's in and this ensnarement that he's in. It's when he comes to the point of realising that he is totally stuck. There's no way out that he can come out himself. And the only one who can help him in this situation is the Lord. So I called. I called out to the Lord, I called out to the Lord, deliver my soul, deliver my soul. You know, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter is preaching the gospel and preaching there is, only, there is only one way of salvation and that is in Jesus, the one who has died, the one who has risen. There is forgiveness of sin, there is res restoration with the Father through Jesus. And they cried out, what must we do to be saved? And what was the call? It was call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Call on the name of the Lord. Paul, writing to the Romans, said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And they're quoting the prophet Joel, right back in the Old Testament, the promise that those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. He will hear. He is a hearing God. It is not an idol. It's not a bit of stone, a bit of wood. It's not a concept that you're talking about. There is the person, the person of God himself. The Lord delights to hear and respond to his people. That's a great thought to start the year with, isn't it? That God actually delights to hear. It's a delight to him that we call out to him. 
And can you see how that, how the, the psalmist try, is trying to express this? The Lord listens, comes close to me. He longs to know where I am. He longs to hear. He longs to be able to respond. And why is that? Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. A massive burst of praise as he stops and reflects. He stops and reflects. How come I am where I am? How come, how come my life is where it is? How come I know and love the Lord as I know? What, what, how come all this has occurred? How come I'm in the body of Christ who'd love to praise the Lord and glorify the Lord together and live in the light of the Lord? Why is this? Because the Lord is gracious and righteous and merciful, reliable, loving, trustworthy, forgiving, personal. Paul expressed something like this in Romans 7. He says, wretched man that I am, as he was reflecting on sinfulness and the bonds of sin, restful man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord, this is another wonderful thing, the Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. That the simple means it, it's talking of that for whom there, there is no merit. You have nothing to plead of yourself. The whole thing is of grace. The Lord loves to shower his mercy and his graciousness and his grace upon his people. Those who are weak, those who are powerless, those who cannot help themselves. God gives total time to those of us who see ourselves in the situation we really are, simple before him. He goes on to expand this. He says, return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt, dealt bountifully with you. As he stops and reflects how the Lord has dealt with him to this point, uh, be at rest, my soul. Now delivered. I'm now delivered. The relationship is restored. I'm one with the Lord. I now have that rest and that peace that only God can give that's based on God's word. And the sum up, Lord dealt bountifully. The song that we started off comes to mind, which is based on Matthew 11:28. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For you have delivered, me, you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. You have brought me out of death into life. The tears that I flow, that flowed are no longer there. You've, you've taken away those tears. And we know, although that we can have tears in this life, uh, we know that the tears will be no more when we go to be with the Lord. And we can even know it, the joy of knowing the Lord today, that even in the midst of sorrow, we can have that joy of knowing the Lord. There will be no more stumbling. There'll be no, the feet will be firm, and they'll be firm in Christ. For you have, this is what we have in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Not only for now, not only in the future, but for the whole of eternity. What a wonderful God. Then comes some response. And the response, verses 9 to 11, he said, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living, I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, 
all mankind a liars. So what he is saying here, as I've now refreshed my thinking and understood again afresh that I'm saved by grace alone and it's the bountiful mercy of the Lord that I am even here. It's the merciful of the Lord that he's revealed himself to, to me and made me his own and I rejoice in that grace and I'm now going to walk in that grace. I'm not only going to be saved by grace, I'm going to walk in that grace. I'm going to live in that grace that he has given that, that faith and that trust and that commitment to his word I'm going to work in. I, I read a year before last, I read a book on the first 300 years of the Christian church. And it was interesting, in the first 300 years of the Christian church, they had no um, ways of doing evangelism. They didn't have evangelistic courses <laughs> and all the things that we have today and so forth. And, and, and they, did, they did no preaching on street corners right, at all in the first 300 years. They were under terrible persecution, you know, the whole time, and yet the church grew faster in that first 300 years than ever before or after. And you're going to say, what was going on here? Well, what was going on here was that the people, as people came to Christ, they came together as a fellowship. And what they did, they studied the Gospels, because the Gospels is what they had, and gradually some of Paul's letters that they had. And they read the Gospels and they said, okay, we're saved by grace, we're going to live by grace. What's it mean to live by grace? We read how Jesus lived and that's how we're going to live. We're going to do the same. We, we are his children. That's how we, and that's what they did. They lived Christ-like lives. And people in the community saw a massive difference. They loved their enemies. Do you, do you know? They sought to do good even when they were persecuted. And so people went, what's going on here? You know, what's happening here? What, what is it? And so they would share the story of the gospel with them. But no one was brought into the fellowship until they had committed their life to Christ. They'd been studying the gospels for a year and their life was demonstrating Christ-like life. Then you were brought into the fellowship. But the, the Spirit of God mightily worked amongst them. Not only did they recognise I'm saved by grace, I walk in that same grace. I walk in the same grace. And we're looking, looking back, we can see, he said, I can see how when I was lost, when I was desperate, but even in the midst of that, you were there. And an interesting thing, you, when you cry out in pain, when you're in pain, you cry out for healing. But unless you recognise your pain, you don't cry out for healing. It's all tied in together. When trouble and despair and despair, and you've got no way out, you cry out to the Lord. So when you cry out, it doesn't really demonstrate you've got lack of faith. It realises you do have. The Lord has given you to understand salvation and the way forward is in me, and that's where it is. And all liars, all are liars means we're all unreliable. It is God alone whose word that we can truly put our total faith and trust. So what shall I render? What shall I render to the Lord for his benefits to me? He says, I'll lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. What shall I render? The concept in the words is I've got nothing. <laughs> There's nothing. It's all of grace. Do you so what, what is it? What, what do I do? Well, he says, I'll lift up the cup of salvation, God's gift through his Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. That gift that is offered on the cross, and I'm going to drink of that gift, he says, and this is the continuous sort of tense here, I'm going to continue to drink of that gift that he's given of salvation. I'm going to continue to call upon his name and I'm going to pay my vow in the presence of the congregation. You know, that there is no such thing as you go through scripture of an isolated Christian. No such thing. It's all the body of Christ. When the Lord draws you to himself, all of a sudden you realise he's drawn you together with all the others he's been drawing to himself. You're now a part of the body. You're now part of the body of Christ. And so that's why automatically you want to go and share with brothers and sisters. This is the way the Lord has worked in my life. Notice what he has done. Let us enjoy and let us embrace the Lord together. 
Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant. Uh, You know, there are wonderful words in this psalm, aren't there? To think that in God's sight we are precious. Isn't isn't that mind-blowing, dear? That God who created heaven and earth and sustains the universe sees each of those that that are his especially as being precious precious to him we are precious to the Lord and then he rounds off the psalm repeating much of what he said he said I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the house of the Lord in your midst O Jerusalem Praise the Lord. For us today, the sacrifice that we give is the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we join together in praise and thanksgiving before the Lord. A great psalm as you start off the year. There'd be many of us who have not had an easy year in the past. Many strains, many distresses. But if you had called upon the Lord, then you know what the psalmist is talking about here. And if you're still struggling and haven't called upon the Lord, then now is the time to do it. And then it's a good time to just stop and rest and realise who we stand, how we stand in the Lord. He's gracious and merciful and loving and righteous. And we stop, what shall I render? Together, the only thing we can render is praise and thanksgiving to God. And as we share how the work the Lord has worked in our individual hearts and lives, it encourages each one of us to, to know and to enjoy that, yes, he does hear. Yes, he does incline his, his ear to us. Yes, we are precious in his sight. Yes, he has stepped in. He wants us to know him and to know him and to love him and to trust him in a very personal way and that we grow together as we come into this new year in our faith and trust and commitment to the Lord. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Amen.